first of all, the, the you mentioned that Chile has uh, strong uh, ministries for agriculture and mining, so industrially useful sectors of the economy. But these are also scientific and technological domains. So, you know, there's innovation in places like agriculture. In fact, the first time I personally came to Chile, it was to discuss biotechnology regulation, because at that time, there were no rules in Chile governing biotechnology. And I was interested that it's not that nobody was doing biotech in Chile, they already were, but it was not for use within Chile. So there was genetically modified seeds being grown for Monsanto in America, but they were not being replanted in Chile. But it turned out that very few people knew of that relationship. So we were talking about democracy and in general, people did not know about these socioeconomic technological relationships across countries. One of the first things that I think civil society groups have fought for is a greater degree of openness about technology policy. It's become popular in innovation circles to talk about upstream engagement, that is people being involved earlier on in the innovation process. Now, often we guard that space with our intellectual property laws that we, that is we, by allowing for patents and other uh, systems that encourage secrecy and exclusion, we actually keep shielded a part of the innovation process where nobody actually enters in and is discussing things. Now, this is, I'm going to say something that is only hypothetical because I don't have the evidence, but you know that today one of the great problems that has emerged in the wake of COVID is that people are resistant to taking the vaccines. There's vaccine hesitancy, there's vaccine resistance. And on the whole, it's not good for society to have a large fraction of people who are not taking the best remedies that are available. But if you look at the development of these vaccines, a lot of the reason why people are hesitant is that they don't believe that the companies are being honest with them, that the evidence is out there. And of course, because of intellectual property rights, that whole early phase of the development of vaccines is shrouded in secrecy. People don't understand what mRNA means and you know what the development of this vaccine is about. I mean, I'll tell you one funny story. When I went to get vaccinated, I went to something called Gillette Stadium, which is the place where the New England Patriots, our local football team, plays. And that had been converted into a vaccine station. And on the billboard where you normally have advertising and the scores posted, they were posting the numbers of people who had been vaccinated, but they were also posting ads for Moderna saying, because Moderna is a local company for us, it's you know, sitting right there next to MIT. And people were posting that mRNA, a modern way to make vaccine, and they were playing with the words Moderna and modern. Um, but it was advertising. You know, this isn't the same as, for instance, allowing school children to come into a lab. And, and you know, the second thing you were asking is about, you know, what can we do to make sure that these excluded, traditionally excluded groups are brought into discussion. And universities obviously have a huge role to play. And what, what can the social sciences do? Well, the brand of social science, the field of social, social science that I have helped to develop, that my name is associated with, is called science and technology studies. And this is a way of saying that in 21st century societies, it's not enough just to do science and technology. We also have to systematically study the role of science and technology in society. That is not typically being done in the other social sciences. We need a dedicated field of study that keeps in mind these developments at the frontiers of science and technology and studies the overall ways in which science and technology um, affect our lives. So one of my hopes in this constitutional moment for Chile 
which began with unrest in the universities. I mean, like many good movements, this began as a student movement to a large extent. The Chilean student movement is famous now. It's, it's something that has not happened in other countries. So it is a moment in which universities can really seek to establish as an educational goal that all students, regardless of what their field is, that they get some training in science, technology, and society, that they learn to think about what it means to embed their work if they're scientists and engineers. What does it mean to take your discovery and put it to use in a technological society? What are the implications? What do we understand about impacts? What do we understand about risks and benefits and how one calculates this? What are the mistakes we've made? Why do we have technological disasters? This should be a part of the education of any citizen. So I think there's a big role for universities and for the social sciences here. And I hope that this is something that Chilean universities will recognize in a way that American universities have not always done. Mm -hmm.